I can have Pastor Todd up here for a moment, please. And uh, my dad, we're going to take communion if, uh, at this part of our service. I want to say thank you all so much for joining us here on this uh, Easter Sunday. Thank you so much for coming and being a part. If I can have Brother Bo, please. And uh, we're going to pass out the celebration of what Christ has done. It says, Paul gave an instruction on this in, uh, in 1 Corinthians where he says, he reminisces of the, the night, the last supper, the last moment, uh, just real uh, strong, deep heart and memory that the disciples had with Christ before his crucifixion. And he says, Jesus turned to him and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant between God and His holy people, an agreement that is confirmed by my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it, as often as you take in the part, remembering the sacrifice of what I've done, remembering the sacrifice of what I am about to do. He's about to lay down His life for our sins so we could be forever free. That's a good thing. Amen? Amen. So at this time, we don't force anything, but we do invite you. We're going to pass the... Fellas, if I can have y'all go on each side. Camilla, I need you to sit with Isaac, please. We're going to pray, and we're going to pass out the bread, and we're going to pass out, we have grape juice in place of wine. And, uh, and I'm going to ask you, if you will, we're going to let this be kind of a personal time before you partake, and we enter into our next just worship music time and corporate time here. So reflect on it. Maybe if there's things in your life that, that have been a burden to confess to the Lord, a, a sin that has lingered on, to confess to the Lord that, Jesus, forgive me. I want to be clean before you again. I want to build my life around you. And I take this, I take this communion right now in a symbol of remembering the covenant where you laid everything down for me, Jesus. And this time as I take part in this covenant, in remembrance of you, I'm doing this surrendering all of my life to you. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you could, if y'all men would pass out on that side, I tell you, um, Brother Kenneth, could I have you over here, please? Brother Justin. Behind him there. Come behind him right there. Amen. 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 Amen.
you know, I would imagine, we know from the scriptures, the disciples, uh, they really had no earthly idea what this meant. Sometimes maybe we do the same thing. We go through the religious participation and follow through just because we know it's the thing to do, what we're supposed to do. i tell you what, could I lead you in a prayer today? Say, Lord Jesus, I pray today that I will understand more than ever before your sacrifice for me. I pray that today I will understand more than ever before the power of the empty tomb. Thank you, Jesus. In his name we pray. Everybody said.
Lord God, I thank you for today, Jesus. I thank you for the good things that you have in store. I thank you that this is a day where we celebrate the greatest event that has ever happened in all of history. It is a death. It is a day where one who died raised his very own life for the salvation of all who will come to you. Jesus, I pray we see that today in churches all over the Miss Lou, all over the world, as we gather together to celebrate you, Jesus. If you would, please pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, please speak to my heart today. Help me to hear what you want me to hear. And help me to live the way you want me to live. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. My name is Danny, I'm the pastor here, and uh, it is so good to have you guys, each and every one. Uh, It's been good for the people that I've gotten to meet, it's been good for the uh, the ones I have not got to meet yet, but I want to tell you, just it is such an honor to have you here today. A blessing. Uh, I think it is a, we're not here out of a tradition or by chance. There is a good reason we're here today. I want to read with you a passage just flying right out of the hat here in Luke 24. Luke 24, and starting verse 11, it says, But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up, and he ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in, and he saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering, what had happened? What had happened? Today, as we wake up and and we celebrate the greatest event in history for the entire world, and we all know what we're gathered around, and we know what today is about, we are also celebrating what was possibly the greatest confusion for many of the followers of Jesus in his earthly time, in his earthly ministry. It was the morning hours of Easter that gave these closest to Jesus a real upfront, if you will, honest look in the mirror at not only who they were, but an up close look in the mirror at what they really believed. For those that loved him the most, that knew him best, that morning was possibly a time of greater confusion than even what the two days prior was. The day they watched their Lord be crucified, and the day they, they watched him die. And how just heart-wrenching and confusing it had to, to be. But I dare say, this day, probably it was even more so than that. You know the story. You know the event. On Friday, before the Sabbath, there was a day that they watched this man who had such a presence about him that when he walked up to each one of them in, in the midst of where they were and said, Come, follow me. Something inside of them, something about this man's voice, Something about meeting this man said that he was like no other they had ever seen. Something on the inside of them about his voice told them that, you know what? When he says, come follow me, it is worth leaving everything I know for what I don't know. It is worth leaving everything behind right here in this moment without him met, meeting him before, without knowing anything about him. Just simply his presence there is something about this man that compels me to forsake everything that I am for whatever it is He's calling me to, for wherever He is going. And while it was an adventurous three years, no doubt, of seeing miracles, of walking on water, of witnessing this man's ability, ability to defy death over and over and over as he walked out of crowds, as they tried to push him off a cliff and he would leave out, as they tried to raise up a riot and he would just disappear in the midst of it. As they watched all this, now for these men rang the word, it is finished. And for them it is finished, you know, these words to us, for them it is finished, did not mean necessarily a good thing. It wasn't like, well, you know, hey, there's another phase of my life, I guess I'll just rock on now, I'll step two, see where we go from here. For them, it is finished to you and I as a celebration because it is finished meant This is where Christ begins to defeat the grave. This is where He wins our sin, wins the victory over our sin. He's dying an innocent man, the Son of God, on behalf of us. For us, it is a good sound. But I would imagine in that moment, they didn't have the backstory. They didn't get to go into the future and look back. When they hear it is finished, 
the words probably sounded more, more like this. It is over. The expectation of a great victory is now a failed hope. And the anticipation of what will happen tomorrow is now a wonder of how do I cope? How do I, how do I move on with life from here? Maybe they reminisced on the time where Lazarus was raised from the dead and, and where he came in and Lazarus had been dead for four days and he shows up and their, his sisters run out there to meet Jesus and they're like, if you'd only been here. And he says, wait, I am the resurrection. And that worked to bring Lazarus back. But let me ask you this. What happens when the greatest hope of resurrection dies? What happens when the one who calls himself the resurrection dies? Let me ask you personally. You don't have to answer out loud, but, but if you will to yourself, just be honest real quick. What did you once have a hope in when you realized it was gone and how empty it felt? Void that comes place. I, I've had many people that I really believed in. I expected the best for. Them. And then I discovered one day that it was all just an act. And I was being used. It hurts. Maybe that is where the disciples were. Maybe they were saying, you know what? You led us to, to believe that this would never end. You led us to believe that this was going to turn out all great. But now, it's over. And maybe it just, maybe on the inside, maybe they were the ones. You know, we like to beat them up about their denying and about the, their, their running and cowards and all that. And we like to kind of nail on that. But you know, maybe they, the reality was they were walking away saying, how could you give up and quit right here? You betrayed us. And we know that wasn't the truth, but put yourself in the moment, the confusion that would have been there. I recall the heart drop of a bad report whenever we were adopting our first daughter. And I remember we'd been through a whole lot of loopholes and a whole lot of hurdles. And the day I came home for Callie to tell me about someone calling who was supposed to know things. Someone calling who was supposed to have some kind of inside scoop. And gave us a report about our daughter who we had not met but we had loved from for a distance at that time. And basically laid out a report that was not correct of how tragic it was and basically advised us that he may want to reconsider. I remember the, the heart sink that says, what? He says, you don't understand. This is two solid years of our heart being completely poured into this. And I know that's not a long time, but when you're living it, it is. And, and you don't understand all that we have gone through. You don't understand all the two solid years of tears. And begging and pleading and waking up in the middle of the night and begging God for a move. And we get to this point, all we have is a picture and we have some words about her. And then all of a sudden with a phone call, you're going to come out of nowhere and say, maybe we should reconsider. And they meant it very well. Our hearts sank. And we wept. The challenge, if you will, our hope, our faith was challenged. Recently we had someone tell us so many things they would help us out with. We're in the process of adopting two children right now and, uh, that have grabbed our heart that we have shed tears over, though we have not met, though we have known but a short while. And, then, and, and, and we don't refer to them as adopted. We refer to them as our children. Our own, our own children refer to them as their brother and sister. And recently we had someone who, when we began, they said, it, this is going to be great. It's going to be easy. We're going to help you. We are in this. We are going to advocate for you. We are going to represent you. We are going to carry this. This will not be like the first time. This one will be so much easier. All the ducks are in a row. This is no problem whatsoever. You're going to enjoy this. It's going to be wonderful. Only to one day after several months we get a phone call. And this fellow on the other end of the line, he says, so let me ask you, uh, how do you plan to take care of your new children? And we tell him and we lay out, and how are you preparing now? And we tell him, tell him. And he goes through all these scenarios and we say, it's time. And he's, He's replying saying, oh, it sounds good. Oh, I can tell y'all already. Oh, that is great thinking right there. That is a great idea. I'm so glad to hear that. Then all of a sudden, after about five or six minutes of just build up, all of a sudden he says, but you're on your own because we're not helping you anymore. We don't think it's a good choice. Goodbye. And just the, the, the empty, the depleting that happens in the midst 
Maybe do you know what it's like to get your hopes up and then just be swept away so quickly? You know, I would say the most heartbreaking issue in a family that has, when, when loved ones are battling addictions a lot of times, the most heartbreaking thing is to think that it's over, it's done, it's finished, and then to get a phone call one day that it's not. And yet these same scenarios, if it's some a stranger, we cheer them on, and a, and a stranger says, all oh, the ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs, and nobody believed them anymore. And then the day that Jesus really set them free, the day that it really came alive, the day that freedom really came after all the ups and downs, and we say, yes, that is an awesome story, that is great. But when it's at home, it's like, I don't know if I can believe again. We lose hope. Easter is resurrection, yes, but in a real way, the early hours for the closest followers of Jesus was a great confusion. The confusion was so great that we know of a man named Judas who was a close follower, even though he was one who betrayed Jesus. He is so overwhelmed with, how could I do this? How could I do it? Why did I do it? He goes out and he takes his own life. The confusion is seen in John chapter 20. Where Mary Magdalene, a very close follower, one of the women that is mentioned, it says, and many women followed in, it names Mary Magdalene out of them all. And it says in verse 1, it says, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, and she found the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. There are a lot of questions to be asked here. Mark tells us that she has went and bought spices and, and ointment to, to re-anoint his body, to re-prepare the body of Jesus Christ for burial. In that day, what they would do is they would take a body that died. It was very unusual for someone who had been crucified to even be buried in the first place. They were typically thrown in a dump. That was part of the punishment. But if you had enough money or you had the right connections, you could go and you could beg the, the officials or maybe buy the right to be able to take down the body. So Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus go up to, to, the, to the rulers and say, can we please take the body of Jesus down because he's already died. And maybe he bribed, maybe he paid. But at the end of the day, they got him, and it says the Sabbath was coming, so they had to quickly, they quickly, they anointed him, and quickly they wrapped him up, and quickly they buried him. Because tomorrow is Sabbath, Passover, and no one, no one does anything on the Sabbath. It is a holy day. But Mary gets up, the Sabbath is not even technically over because daylight has not come. And in the darkness, this is kind of part of the weird story too, she kind of, she kind of, goes aside from the Sabbath and she can't stand anymore and she goes to his body. And a body that at that time they would typically, they would wrap them, they leave them in the tomb for a, a certain amount of time, whatever time it was that required, and they, after a certain amount of time they'd come back, they'd roll the stone after the body had time to, the flesh to decay and remove. And they would collect the bones. And they would put them in what was called an ossuary or a bone box. If you look this up, you can see that these things, they're, they're about this big, they kind of almost look like they're made out of some kind of plaster. I'm sure it's made out of something more. And, and they'll have the inscription of who it was or maybe something great. Kind of like we'd do a tombstone on the front. And maybe, you know, they would go back later and get Jesus. And the plan was to get Jesus, maybe take him back to his bones to his mom so she could do bury him or have a morning time or, or to some other family or go back and bury it in another location. But Mary, Mary Magdalene shows up on the two days after death. She's on the, on the third morning of no life. You know, some people kind of question why she would even do it, that maybe Mary Magdalene just woke up in the middle of the night and it just hit her and said, you know what? Two men prepared his body and they were in a hurry. I know they didn't do a good job. I got to go fix it. Why would you go back into a body that has been there for two days and, and revisit it and reopen it. This is not a pleasant situation. It was not the norm at that time. Regardless of why she did it, what love to love someone so much to do such a deed that nobody else will ever know about just because you love them that much. But John 20 and verse 2, it, it, it opens up the story a little bit and it says, when she saw it empty, she ran and she found Simon Peter, the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Why would she say they? 
Because somebody had to do it, obviously. She doesn't know who they is, but she does know one thing. Dead people don't change location. Dead people don't move. And on Easter morning, regardless of how much she loved Jesus, regardless of, of all the great miracles, regardless of the way that he had touched her and healed her in his lifetime, there was one reality that was set in with Mary very well, Mary Magdalene. Regardless of all the memories, regardless of the tomb being empty, Jesus was dead. And dead people stay dead. The dead man moving is what caused Luke, Peter in Luke 24, 12 to, to look in and peer and walk away wondering, what, what is going on here? What is happening? To go and look and walk away just in in bewilderment. He didn't know. And I bet if we get completely honest, a lot of us really don't know either. Why we're possibly, we're even here today. We, there's a lot of things that we do. We just do, we do, but we don't really know why. Because we say religious good talk with our mouth. We've all learned how to give Sunday school answers as children, even growing up. But we have had moments that undoubtedly the call of Jesus was speaking to us, was pulling on our hearts with everything, the, 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 and, but we walk off because though we know the call is real, we cannot deny the moment, we cannot deny the emotion of brokenness, we cannot deny that the hope we feel is so real in those moments, but when we compare Jesus with our flaws, with our sins, with the things that we do that make us feel bad in the church-type environments, if everyone was to know, if we were to throw a screen up here and show what each of us has done, the things we would feel shame about, when we compare them to Jesus, it's like, really? We see Him just like Mary did, just as Peter did, just as the other disciples did. And we say, against who I am, Though I know all this is so real that I am feeling and hearing his voice calling me, he's dead. He's powerless. And he can't help me. And this is where the confusion comes in. And quite possibly, maybe you have experienced it. Uh, if you know what you feel bad about, and you know that you don't think you will ever change because the sin that you feel is who we are. If that's so, then why do I feel this, if this sin that I feel has so condemned me, then why do I feel this tug, that, that why do I feel this feeling that without a doubt that Jesus is making me feel wanted and loved again? If this sin is so condemning, if I am so stuck, if I am so who I am that I will never change, but though I feel Jesus tugging at me, the Holy Spirit pulling at me saying, come my child and follow me, if, it, if this sin is so powerful, why do I feel him pulling on me. And he causes a confusion. Why does he even let me know that he is real if my sins and my flaws of who I am? If he can't help me. This is a confusion that the woman at the well embraced. Remember, she is so ashamed. She, she's, she's been married so many times that she's given up and she's went to other means and, and she shows, she takes it upon herself to pick the hottest time of the day to make the most work on herself, to go to a well to get water that was necessary, but to go to a well and intentionally even to, to make herself suffer to not see anyone else because of her own condemnation. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to see the glances. I don't want to hear the, the remarks. I'm willing to put pain on my life to avoid the, com the confrontation. But yet Jesus goes out of His way geographically, physically, to meet her at the place where she wanted to know no one. He went out of his way for a woman that, to give special attention to a woman that was going out of her way to receive the attention of no one because of her own guilt, because of her own shame, to make sure that he would not miss her. This confusion, I'm sure, is what was embraced by Matthew. Can you imagine this man, his own people call him scum. The religious people call him the scum. That they don't want anything. He is he is a man who is who is by his own choice. He has out front, vocally, 
physically and in action, he has betrayed his entire people, his country, his family, and everything that has ever made him what he is at this moment. He has betrayed all of that in the pursuit of money. And he knows the man that he is. But yet, Jesus goes out of the way to find Matthew and say, Come, follow me, and be my disciple. It had to be confusing to be wanted so genuinely when the world had condemned him so publicly. It must have been all the more troubling and confusing, though, when this man, Jesus, actually died. Surely at any minute, he always came out of death. He always walked, but surely at any minute, he's going to come off the cross, and he's going to be here in perfect condition. Surely. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of right. They betray him and when, he's getting, when, the, when they come to arrest, but at the cross, it mentions the, some of the disciples being there at the cross witnessing what has happened. And he even speaks to one from the cross. Why would somebody who ran in fear of being killed themselves, why would somebody who ran from fear of the torture, why would someone who, who was so afraid stand right there in the midst of the cross? Surely at any moment you're coming down, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. You always get out. You always walk away. You, somehow, I don't know how you do it, you walk on water, you walk through crowds, you, you do whatever you want, but you always come out. Surely you're coming down today. And I'm going to be here to welcome you. Surely at any minute he would defy death. But no. Instead, he said, it is finished. Which for them, it meant it's over. Have you ever had the situation where you felt like, it's just over. It's just done. There's no hope. Can't do anything about it. I tried and I tried and I quit because it's over. I can't give anymore. It's over. But within a matter of weeks, something happened to these same men, to the men that followed Jesus, the men who ran in confusion, who walked away from the deepest sadness and the deepest despair at the cross that day. These men who walked away from an empty tomb wondering, bewildered, and confused, the Scripture tells us. Let's just backtrack just for a minute, just to, just to make a little sense. Some, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, a saying that goes around talks about the Bible. And it says, it is a book that is written by men, and men are flawed, so therefore the Bible is flawed. But here's the, the problem with that. If I'm going to write a story, and I bet you'd be the same, if you're going to write a story and pass it down for generation to generation, to, to go out and proclaim to the whole world, if I, we're going to write a story, we're more likely to make ourselves the heroes on it. I mean, you check us out on social media. We do everything great. And we tell everybody, and we want to go back and see if they liked it. Right? We are the heroes. If you don't believe it, watch what I take a picture of what I cook tonight. We are the heroes. That was just for fun. I really, that's no judgment. I, I kind of like looking at your food. It makes me hungry. But, but. We are the heroes. You know, I would be, if I was going to be uh, uh, Peter or, or, or John, for instance, who's writing this right here, I think I would be more like this. And I remember when everybody ran away. Nobody believed in him. But I did. And I remember watching him and when everybody ran away and everybody was in fear. But not me. I was right there by his side the whole time. I mean, truth. And, uh, it, the, the people who know, and it makes a lot of sense, say it takes about 85 to 90 years for a story that, that is that being passed along to kind of cycle from one generation and to get uh, uh, distorted in the next to the point it goes on and on for generations to finally just removed or it becomes a myth at best. It, you know, because the generation who can witness it has to be out of the picture or therefore they can verify that you're making it up. But the disciples... Within a matter of weeks, they pour into the street with the message they're going to have. Right in front of the people who witnessed everything, in front of the people who could discount everything, in front of the people that if it, anything was made up, they could say, whoa, we were there, and you're wrong. And they, they didn't wait. It's not 85, 95 years. The writers of the Bible were right there on the scene. They're reporting these things within weeks of it happening a lot of times. And they promote themselves in the midst of all this as confused, wandering. You know why they seem so bewildered and confused and, and just so unsure? 
so afraid? Because they were bewildered and confused and afraid. You know, but in Acts, Acts follows Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's the Acts of the Apostles. It's where we're going to begin next week. And the, the Acts, they did Acts, is what they did after the resurrection of Jesus. And one day they're walking into the temple and they send healing to a man in Acts chapter 3. And, and this man is begging and they say, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ and Nazarene, get up and walk. And they pick this man up and he walks. That's pretty amazing. Coming from weeks before, you're like, I don't know who Jesus is to in the name of Jesus. Get up and he gets up. That's pretty good. And, but this, what happens is, as a result of this, everybody knows what's going on. Everybody saw it happen. And all of a sudden, a crowd forms. And Peter, he's, he's, a, he's a great preacher. He sees a crowd, and he's like, hey, I know what this means. Time to preach. And so he, he starts off in, in verse thir- Acts chapter 3, verse 13. It says, this is the same Jesus. Y'all are marveling. Y'all are wondering what's going on with this man. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and whom you rejected before Pilate despite Pilate's decision to release him. And you rejected the holy and the righteous one, and instead you demand the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses to this fact. And then of these two, these things. We, God, you killed him, you did it, and God raised him, and he's alive, and he lives, and we have seen it. These cowards, these men who ran, they denied, confused, bewildered. They now stand at the masses, and their message is, you killed Jesus, but God raised him from the dead, and he lives. Not lives, but lives is a very key thing right here. But wait, look what happens next. This speech, it gets them arrested. So in Acts chapter 4, all of a sudden, they get arrested and they are placed in front of the people who condemned Jesus' very own death, who witnessed it, who dropped the handkerchief, who said, let this be so, crucify him. There, his, 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 his sermon, it brings them out, and what he is standing for, Caiaphas and the other leaders who, who had Jesus crucified. And they're supposed to give a testimony now. They're supposed to tell, why are you telling these things? And they could be, it's not like our court system. It's not like they got a jury box and a judge over here and witnesses out there. I mean, they are arguably probably just standing right there in the midst and all these men are around them. We know this is kind of how some of the cases go because Paul later on, he goes to trial, he reaches up and slaps one of them. So they had to be pretty close. You know, probably even within four, six, eight feet. And they're saying, what are you talking about? And possibly even, I could see Peter even possibly pointing in his face, let me clearly state to you. And to all of you, and to the people of Israel, that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. The man you, Caiaphas, you, priests, you, rulers, the man you crucified, but God raised him from the dead. And there is salvation in no one else. And God has given no other name, verse 12, under heaven by which we must be saved. In verse 13, they go on to say that, 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 that these priests, they saw them, they examined them, they saw that they were ordinary men, fishermen, people who didn't have training, didn't have special knowledge. And it says they saw their boldness and no special training, and they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. The message of the apostles, the message that the only way it could have survived past the first century was that it had to be true. This is the message they run out into the street shouting. The message that caused these cowardly, confused men to be so bold and to declare so adamantly what they saw is the message that, church, we're here and we celebrate today. And this message is this. It's not in the Jesus who lives. But their message was, we know the Jesus. And we've seen the Jesus. And we testify of the Jesus who not only lives, but He lives. Not just then, but He lives. And today where I want to land you is right here. Even the disciples began with excitement. 
probably know what it's like to get really excited about something, get your hopes up, and then... Even the disciples began with an excitement. Even the disciples began with a movement. Even the disciples began with a, with a stirring in them that, man, this is good. Even those closest had a confusion. But they moved past the confusion. And they found strength. They found confidence. They found a bold hope. When they quit believing for the Jesus who lived. And they began trusting in the Jesus who lived. And church today, well, when all we do is embrace what He did, sometimes it leads to confusion. What He did was great. What He did was all acts of the Son of God. They are holy. They are righteous acts. They are miracles beyond wonder. But what He did is what He did before He died. And at His death, it brought the great confusion because they believed in what He did. But when they began to trust in the one who lives, it created these confused, bewildered men out into the street and out into a covenant that they would look death in the face and say, We can't help but deny, we can't help but, but confess to the fact we have witnessed firsthand. Though Jesus has ascended into heaven, we still stand today saying, He doesn't live, He lives. And we put the rest of our life in this. We will give our life, and most every one of them did, for this simple truth, that He lives, and we can't help but tell about it. And church, I don't know where, what may bring confusion in your life, but I want to encourage you today. There is a powerful transition when we quit seeing Jesus who stopped at the cross, and we begin seeing the Jesus who came out of the tomb, and who is the one who draws on your and my heart today. One who says, come follow me today. I don't have to make the words up. You know them. I remember very well being in the service where I had no concern about Jesus. August 25th, 97, where Jesus said, Danny, I'm trying to get into your heart. And I said, Lord, I don't know what's wrong. I don't understand what's going on with me. But obviously you won't. So if you'll come to my life and be my king, I'll live for you from now on. Maybe that's a simple prayer that can be prayed in here today. If you never have before, I want to encourage you, follow me. If you want to, if you want to move from the Jesus who lived and trust in the Jesus who is, who lives, would you please say the simple prayer with me? I'll tell you what, everybody, let's pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for giving your life for me. But Lord, I thank you even more for living for me. Thank you for hope. Thank you for joy. Thank you for victory that is based on the fact that you live. In Christ, I ask you to live in me. In Jesus' name, Everybody says, Amen. If you pray that prayer for the first time, if you will, everybody, let's please stand. We're going to celebrate with the baptism here in just a moment, a celebration of new life, of resurrection, of, of rising up new man, to having bury, burying ourselves in a watery grave. And it says, the power of God in Corinthians that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now raises you. We're going to celebrate that here in just a moment. But before we get there, if you just pray that prayer for the first time, I would love to